Hey, everybody. Welcome to Counseling Moments with Pastor Kevin. The podcast that helps us connect the significant moments of our lives to Scripture. Hey, I want to address something uh, today. First of all, I, I just have my uh, I, got, I have a question that came in on the Counseling Moments at Hespeler.ca email, and I want to take a, uh, just a couple minutes up front to address that question. The question uh, is uh, from the episode on uh, that I talked about ladders to nowhere, which is a, a concept that was introduced to me by uh, Dr. David Pollison. And the question is this, and I, I'm just going to read this. It's so encouraging to see different ability, personality, our weaknesses as human differences instead of good or bad. But as I think about real life, I feel it's difficult to just stay cool and simply view the scope just as human differences at some circumstances. There, are, there is competition in life. For example, in applying for a job, and another person gets it, that person seems to have a better ability or qualifications than me. I might feel bad about myself or be hard on myself that I'm not as good as that other person. If I'm a student who is going to graduate school or looking for a future job. But among the graduated students, there are many who seem to have better ability. Better ability might mean better opportunities in the job market. How can I stay confident for my future? And... Uh, I, I want to answer that question by saying when when we ref, when we refer to ladders to nowhere as not being uh, measures of value, we're not denying that in life we are we are being measured and compared and in some ways in competition with others for certain desirable placements and positions. What I'm what I'm saying is that when it comes to those matters, I, I think in terms of fittedness. Am I the best fit for a particular job? Am I the best fit for a particular company? Am I, am I the best fit for a particular person in relationship? Am I, the best, uh, am I the best fit for this job? Am I as qualified and equipped for it as I'd like to be? But when I'm speaking of value, I'm speaking of our value as a person. And your value is not determined by whether or not you get a particular job, live in a particular neighborhood, drive a particular car, marry a particular person. Your value as a human being is rooted in two things. One, you are created in the image of God. And as an image bearer of God, even marred by sin and fallenness, you have that value that God has instilled in you as an image bearer. And because we bear God's image, we, have, uh, we are valuable. Uh, the second way we find value, then, is in our relationship to God. God. God loves us, and we are his children. And we, Scripture speaks about us as being uh, the glory of God, the glory of Christ, those who have been rescued, those who are in Christ, those who are rescued from sin, those who are rescued from condemnation and are saved, we are the work of God in, in a fresh sense in Christ, and we have value there. And so whether or not we are able to um, do a particular job as well as the next person and, 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 and let's face it, sometimes the, the people who are judging those things, we, we don't necessarily agree with them, or we, we think they might have miscalculated or missed something. And that, in fact, can be the case. Often, sometimes we don't get the job, not because we aren't the most qualified, but because we're simply perceived as not being the most qualified for the job. But for me, that is not a matter of personal value. That's not where we find our value. Our value is in Christ, and our value is as image bearers of the Most High God. Yet, there are these differences make a difference. And we, we want to also trust in the providence and the purposes and the plan of God for our lives that He would He will care for us and He will He will He will put us on a path to where our giftings and our abilities find a good fit. 
and and to be able to serve God in those capacities. So that's a, a, a real brief answer to that question. It's a good question. What do we do in a world that is constantly judging us and using criteria that uh, doesn't doesn't really indicate our true value as a person? And yet, it's it's these are differences that make a difference. So thank you for the question. I encourage more questions. You can send your questions to Counseling Moments at Hespeler. Baptist.ca, and I will do my best to respond to them uh, in the podcast. Now, on to uh, what I wanted to talk about today, and that is what foot washing has to do with discipleship. And here at Hespler Baptist Church, we are learning uh, first principles uh, from Simeon Trust and a study in learning how to handle God's Word well. And in, in this uh, study that we did on a, on a past Sunday night, we looked particularly at John 13 through 17. And I want to share some takeaways I took from that study that I gleaned uh, in my study of this passage following, following the teaching and, and what foot washing has to do with discipleship. So let's read the passage and go from there. John 13, 1 through 17. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart of, out of the, this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter answered him, and Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than, those, than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So there's the text. And this is happening in the context of uh, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper that, that Jesus has with his disciples before he goes out to the garden and prays, and then he's betrayed by Judas, and he's arrested, tried in a kangaroo court, and essentially uh, condemned by Rome and, and crucified. And what, what Jesus is doing here is he is giving foot washing here as a physically tangible metaphor, just as the bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper is for us. And, and how, how do we get that? Well, let's look at the context of this passage. In the context, Jesus is about to be crucified, right? And, and we, we know that because it's, it's embedded in the text. It's Passover, right? This is now just before the feast of Passover, so Passover is here. This is the Passover meal that Jesus is sharing with his disciples, Passover itself in the Old Testament is pointing toward Messiah, pointing toward Christ. And Jesus approaching this meal, it says in verse 1, knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world. Furthermore, we see at the end of verse 1 that the text is saying that he, Jesus, loved them to the end. He loved his own who were in the world and he loved them to the end. And that, that word, telos, 
that's being translated end here is, is the same essential word as the verb um, teleo, which is the verb that Jesus is, uses on the cross when he says, it is finished. He loved them to the end. What end are we referring to? He loved them to the end of his earthly ministry. He loved them all the way to the end, even his death on the cross. He was loving his disciples. And so the cross is very much in mind here in looming in this text. This is what's happening. This is what we're approaching. We also see this in verse 7 when Jesus answered them. When, when Peter asks, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. After what is the question? After what will, will Peter understand? And there, there, there might be an, a, a few answers to the afterward. What's the afterward referring to? I would contend that afterward here refers to after the cross. The cross is the next thing that's coming. After the cross, you will understand. Uh, perhaps Peter doesn't even understand fully until the resurrection or the coming of the, of the Holy Spirit at, at um, Pentecost. But, but the afterward, I think, here is referring to the cross because that's what's looming on the horizon for Jesus. And we see that foot washing is essentially a metaphor because we also see here in verse 8, Jesus says, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So then Simon says, well, if I don't have a share with you unless you wash me, then not only my feet, but also my hands and my head wash all of me. And Jesus said, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. And so we understand that this cleanness that Jesus is referring to is not a physical cleanness, a cleanliness of the body per se, but a cleanliness of the spirit, a cleanliness of the soul cleanliness of the person before him, a spiritual cleanness. That's why Judas is unclean and Peter is clean. And Jesus is just extending the metaphor in this idea of bathing. And Jesus is the one who bathes us. We must be bathed in Christ to be clean. Yet, nevertheless, as life goes on, we need to have our feet cleaned from time to time. And Jesus washes their feet, and then he commands them to wash one another's feet. And so this is a role that we can have. We are not the bathers. We are not the one who makes clean. But we are able to imitate Christ in bathing one another's feet, uh, this necessary cleanness, um, this additional step that we, we do after we have bathed. And the metaphor fits because, as we know, uh, in, in, in a dusty uh, culture, dusty land where sandals were worn, you could bathe, go out in the morning, and you could be relatively clean, but your feet would get dirty just walking on the roads. And so oftentimes when you would go into the house, you would have your feet washed by servants so that your feet would be clean as you go inside the house. So that's the metaphor. But what we're seeing here is that... Um, Jesus is talking about the significance of washing as a spiritual cleanness. Jesus is the only one that can bathe us, but he gives us an example of how we may wash one another's feet. So then, what does it mean to wash one another's feet? Well, frequently this text gets used as uh, to teach servant leadership, which is not wrong. It, in fact, that, that is what is happening here, is that uh, there is servant ser servitude, uh, we are serving one another, but we, but in what particular way are we serving one another? We are participating in one another's sanctification and moving towards spiritual maturity together through discipling, servant leadership, right? That's, that's what we're doing. We are, we are cleaning the feet of one another. And, and we, might, we might participate in in acts of physical, practical, tangible service to one another as part of discipleship, right? We, we see in, in Scripture, we, we don't just tell people to go be warm and well-fed and not provide them with food and, and clothing and cover. But essentially, all the acts that we're doing is to draw people to Christ, to bring people to Christ with us, to show them Christ, to 
to help help them grow in their faith to maturity in Christ. And that's essentially, I think, what the metaphor is referring to here is we will participate, we will serve one another humbly, putting others others' interests before our own, aiming to help them uh, to grow up mature in Christ so that we are all presented together. We see this metaphor fleshed out in other places. In Ephesians 5, the metaphor of washing is used again in reference to husbands and wives. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, it reads, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So uh, we see this metaphor again of spiritual washing, sanctification, uh, being saved, being cleaned by Christ. And we see that this cleansing comes from Christ giving himself up for her, and that again is referring to the cross. Verse 27, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And husbands are being called to love their wives in such a way to help in their sanctification, which again, I would say, matches with the metaphor of foot washing. And so that's how foot washing has to do with discipleship. That's what foot washing has to do with discipleship, and that Uh, We are being called to participate in the maturing of our fellow believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, bringing them to maturity in Christ through discipling efforts. And this is how we participate in each other's sanctification, bringing each other to Christ, showing each other Christ, imitating Christ for one another, putting the spiritual interests of others ahead of our own, helping walking alongside, discipling others so that we all attain to maturity in our faith in Christ. And so that's, uh, that's what I want to leave you with today, and I want to thank you for uh, joining me as we considered uh, John 13, 1 through 17 and the metaphor of foot washing. So God bless you as you go on with your week.